Yeah. Um, you know, like she said, um, many years ago, I used to know a lady. Um, her name was Marcy. Um, Marcy um, was pregnant with her last child. She had eight kids. She had seven prior to that one that she was pregnant for. And um, shortly before she had her baby, her husband died. It was brutal. But anyway, luckily for her, she had relatives um, who are in America. And for some reason, the only way they can communicate is to go to NITEL to make a call. Some of you should remember that. Um, anyway, fast forward now a little bit after that. Marcy had her kid, her eighth child, as a matter of fact, and continued raising the kids. Now, somewhere down the road, one of those kids was going to CIC, walking down the whole of CIC every day. And then also, after that, went to UNEC. Then after that, from UNEC, um, he went to America. But before he went to America, he went to Port Harcourt for housemanship. And then from Port Harcourt, he went to Lagos for NYSC, and then ended up in America. In America, he started a medical center. He's um, the owner of the medical center. He's there but he's so into technology that he decided to delve into technology and started an on-demand cab service here in Enugu. Now why do I say this story? This is a story that most of you here would easily easily relate to but what if I tell you that there's another pathway another pathway that has been with us longer than what I just described a pathway that has seen successes like Chief Ilodibe of the famed Ekenedi Chuku, who is late now, by the way. Like Chief Chukuma of, um, of uh, Enosim Motos, who is, happens to be my friend. And all the other ones who have made Igbos who they are today. Who have made them the, that wonderful thing that people study about. And that thing is called the Igbo, Igbo Apprentice Scheme, or Imwahia. Imwahia literally translates to, to learn the market. 50 years exactly from this month, or well, last month now, there was a war, a Biafran war. A Biafran war that was brutal, that was destructive. It left every Igbo man completely penniless. When they came back to Nigeria, they were given 20 pounds. Let me tell you what 20 pounds equivalent is now. 1,000 Naira. How many of you have been, been to the market with 1,000 Naira to buy something? If you get a bottle of Coke and maybe bread, you're lucky. But that's what they started with. 20 pounds. Go and look around. Go to Enugu. Go to any Igbo city. The Igbo apprentice scheme has turned the Igbo into a superpower. The Igbo apprentice scheme is so successful that it's been, it's been learned in many high institutions in the world. They are looking at it to see what is this? How does this work? How, do, how come that the people who were devastated, destroyed by such a brutal war are back on their feet, roaring like a lion. If you go anywhere in the world and you don't see an evil man, leave. Because that place is not good to, <laughs> for business. So now, think about this. Think about the success that has happened in this group. I have to say that if you transpose this to any other society, then you begin to see the impact of what I'm about to say now. Now, just oppose the Igbo apprentice scheme to technology. So, I call it the Modern Igbo Technological Apprentice Scheme. When you bring these two together, now you begin to see where we can all head to. Just imagine a technological company in Enugu, like mine, GavaCab, or any other one, has a very, very, very good, very, very good programmer, what I would call a master programmer. And that programmer has maybe one or two kids, youngsters who are entering school or from any social background, working for them. Now, the original Igbo Apprentice Scheme takes five to eight years for you to graduate. And if you happen to be smart, when you finish the program, if you happen to be smart, patient, and some little qualifications, the original business owner will settle you. The word settle means they will set you up, blah, 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 and all that. So, but in this technology scheme, in this new modern one, what if I tell you that it will only take one or two years for you to get to that position? 
What if I tell you that the programming may not be the only thing? What if robotics is, in, is involved? What if artificial intelligence is involved? What if satellite geolocation and satellite internet is involved? Now you're beginning to see where we're heading. Just imagine for one second that the government of Southeastern states, South South states, and even every other place in Nigeria decides to kind of get involved in this scheme, not only by supporting it, but proactively putting money, putting stuff down. Now you're beginning to see an Imwahia, which is completely, completely a personal enterprise intertwining with government. When you see that happen, my people, that's what we call accelerated technology. It's happening in other countries, India, for instance. Why I'm saying this is Enugu, as the, one of the speakers have already said, is a hub. Enugu is where a lot of things can happen. We are in Enugu, we are in Asata, Enugu. If, if we get it right, if there's a way we can find that master programmer, that guy who knows very well about technology, to start something, build a hub, get some youngsters, give them two years, they will work for you. They will work their air off. They will work for you. And within one to two years, they have mastered the art. They have done everything you asked them to do. Let them lose. Let's just say you took five people. Five people, right? Right. So five people takes five people. That's 25, right? And that takes another five people. That's one, two, five. Now another five people, that's six, two, five. And you take another one, 3,125. I think my mass is still a little bit good. <laughs> so now, now you begin to say, could you imagine a Nugu with 3,125 master programmers? That's the talent we can build in this society and all the societies in Nigeria. Sometimes I read on the internet where some Igbo guys are caught doing this, this. And I'm thinking, why are they not programming? What is there to program? The same talent that you use to do all these other things, you can actually put less energy to programming. That's why I came all the way from where I live to here because I wanted to talk about this. I wanted us to kind of think about this. I wanted all the people here, here who are into technology to step back, think about it. Think about what has been able to raise a people who were crushed to the ground, people who got only 20 pounds 50 years ago to an international superpower. If there is a scheme that has done that, I think if you transpose and just oppose that same scheme to technology, 50 years from now, we'll be going to the moon. I want all of us to kind of hone into that, hone into the idea that technology is not what you see every day. Yesterday, I got a text from Marcy. She said, how are you? I said, I'm fine, mommy. Marcy, at the time I was, I got to know her because the day she saw me was the day I saw her. And from that time to now, she used to go to NITO to make her calls. Now she's on WhatsApp. She has an IG handle. Think about it. And we're talking about within the past few years. I'm that young, yeah. <laughs> now, think about 50 years from now. Whatever you know about technology today is not going to be the same. I'm in America, and I'm able to see pinpoint, I'm talking about precision, exactly where one of the cabs in my on-demand business is, exactly where it is. I can actually call him and tell him, you're in front of the house. Some of them might be here, and they marvel. That's where we're living. That's the future. That's where we are today. Let me give you a little hint about the future. The next 10 years, 20 years, science will be so advanced that everything, everything will interlace with everything. Everything, your phone talks to your door, your door talks to your neighbor, your neighbor, everything will be interwoven and in real time with utmost precision. Utmost precision. So what I'm saying is we all have to step back, look at where we are, and then assess this scheme that has already been with us. Remember, the Igbo Apprentice Scheme has already been with us. It's not something new. It's something we've used forever. It's something that is so transformational. 
that if you get a way to bring in technology into the scheme, what you're now doing is you're no longer leaving this scheme to people who just come in, an uncle, for instance, picks up one of the nephews or somebody who's known in the family and trains them and they keep training. You now bring in brilliance. You bring in the educated, you bring in the people who just don't want to go to school, like some of the speakers that spoke in the past, but are brilliant nevertheless. When you now bring in this chemistry, you begin to see that the future is in our own hands and we have to grab it by the horns. Now, with the modern Igbo technological apprentice, I would say, take the Igbo off. Bring in any other tribe in Africa. Bring in any other developing nation. Give them the same scheme and give them 50 years. There will be the same place where America, where I live, is today. So my people, let me round this up by saying technological advancement futuristically has started. We need to start yesterday. Thank you all.